Good morning, students. So <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about the sociological perspectives. Essentially, what we're going to be doing is diving into the three paradigms. Now, before we get to the slides, let me kind of go over what these three paradigms are, right? And it's going to be important for you to learn this because one of the assignments that I may or may not have as extra credit is having you look at the world from these perspectives, the topics that we're covering. We cover so many different huge and important topics from the perspective of the sociological understanding. And to do that, you have to have an understanding of what these paradigms or these perspectives are. And there are three major ones, structural functionalism, conflict theory, and symbolic interactionalism. So I'm gonna be taking you down a little bit of a path here of how we from the sociology study branches cover these sociological perspectives and why they matter. So first things first, Today, we're gonna to be covering, as I mentioned, the sociological perspective. So first off, what is a perspective, right? The word paradigm always kind of seems like it's something that is a little bit hmm, confusing, right? Paradox, you might confuse that, but paradigm essentially is looking at things from a broader framework. We're looking at things from a different perspective, a different view. And in sociology, we use what is called the sociological imagination to be able to understand how to view things in a different construction, in the social construction of reality. So as the slide says, a paradigm is a broad perspective that helps to explain many different aspects of social life. And we use this in the sociological perspective to broaden our view to understand why the world works the way it does and why these constructions of reality intertwine with our day-to-day -day life, intersect with how we live. So as I mentioned, there are three different paradigms in sociology. One, structural functionalism. Two, socio-conflict or social conflict theory. And three, which is the symbolic interactionist view. They come from both a macro and a micro perspective, but structural functionalism was once considered a macro like conflict theory, theory, but now it's kind of a mid theory. It has a middle ground. It kind of works both on macro and the mid level, but it does not look at the micro. The only one of these theories that looks at the day-to-day -day interactions and the value of symbols and powers is symbolic interactionalism. And we'll get to that at the end. So let's start with the meat and potatoes. Structural functionalism essentially is a mid theory, like I said, right? Not mid like the term in Gen Z, meaning it's not great. Mid meaning that it is the middle ground. It covers both large and small dynamic, large and medium dynamics, right? It views, it views society as a complex system with many interdependent parts. So the way to look at this and the way I kind of usually talk about this in my classes and my lectures is this. Structural functionalism, depending how you want to view it, is either a car or a body. Why do I say this? Well, the parts work together to promote social stability and cohesion. Poverty as a huge issue that we all do not enjoy plays a role inside society. So does all the other different elements that go into our day-to-day -day existence. Not all of them are positive, not all of them are negative, but the reality is, is that all of them play into the interdependent parts of our day-to-day -day existence. So like a car, all the gears, rotors, valves, and pipes play into how we work. And we don't question these until we see the check engine light come on. When that light comes on, most of us are like, oh crap, I'm gonna owe some money, right? <laughs> That's the reality, right? But we don't think about that when our car is just functioning. And this is kind of what we look at with the structural functionalist perspectives. It seeks to, the system seeks to maintain equilibrium. Poverty enforces the ability to be able to want to gain wealth. Wealth is the goal. It becomes the value that we're looking for, right? We all have a value that we want. We talk about values and beliefs to be wealthy. So these tend to ignore the conflicts between groups. So we're not looking at this from the conflict perspective of social inequality and equity. It's more about how does society function? How does it move forward? And it moves forward through changes and results from gradual adjustment to engage or disengage. So when that check engine light comes on, structural functionalists use what is called the idea of manifest, latent, and dysfunctions. So if the intended function is working, we're fine. If there is a positive latent function, that might be okay, right? This might be a good thing. But if there is a dysfunction causing that check engine light to come on, then society is able to look at it, try to figure out that part. So think about the human body. If we have a virus, we have to figure out how we're going to solve that. That is what we're looking at with structural functionalism. Now, there have been grand theories that have been talked about in regards to this. There have been more of just theoretical perspectives. But functionalism essentially views everything as an interdependent parts that go together to create the whole of society that we have created. So think about it like a car, think about it like a body. <clears throat> We're looking at how it all functions together, not the conflict between groups. We're trying to figure out, does this maintain the equilibrium of society? 
Now, some key elements to this is the social structure. Every single day, we maintain the social construction of reality, essentially, what is normal, what is not, what are the norms, how do we engage in day-to-day -day life, how do we follow these rules, why do we have these rules, and are they functioning to benefit us, right? We have the hidden curriculum of education. This teaches us the rules, rights, and regulations of society, the shifts and oscillations. It allows us to understand how to raise our hand, how to wait turns, how to cue in lines, how to gain academic knowledge, manifest and latent functions, right, also dysfunctions. Basically, any act or process that contributes to the maintenance or the maintaining the equilibrium society of the social system is what is the key element of structural functionalism. Now, there have been plenty, plenty <clears throat> of challenges to functionalism that, and for example, a very famous one is that in the idea and the origination of functionalism, homosexual relationships or being a part of a queer community was viewed as a dysfunction. The reason for this is because they were viewing it as it did not create childbirth. It did not continue the, the existence of life. Now with the idea of adoption and the idea of LGBTQ rights and people being able to raise families and society being able to keep continuing, it's not being viewed as such. But in the views of functionalists, originally this is one of the controversial topics, they looked at it as not engaging in the continuation of society. This is why it was viewed this way. So the social functions of our day-to-day -day lives are a very big important part, right? A complex and interconnected machine, any and a social structure is any act that contributes to the maintenance of social systems. Social functions are stable routine-like patterns of interaction. So why do we go to the store? How are stores functioning? How do we get food? How do we get our car repaired? How do we engage with one another? How does this society have currencies? How do we maintain material and non-material culture? What is the value behind them? These are the questions we're asking with social functions. What is the function? What is the purpose? What is the intended outcome? And how do we know if there's a dysfunction? And like I was just saying, dysfunctions are any action or behavior that has a negative consequences for a group or a larger portion of society that causes disruption within the flow of the equilibrium of society. So, Let's talk a little bit about the theorists who contributed to the idea of structural functionalism. The founder and one of the founders of sociology, Emile Durkheim. Emile Durkheim is a man, just so you know, I've had a few people say that she, because of the name, it's a man. He lived from 1859 to 1917. He helped to solidify sociology as a field in itself with his view on, with his works called Suicide, looking at the dynamic impact of, is suicide a individual or a group decision? Very, very interesting book if you're interested. Uh, essentially, he came up with the idea of social facts to understand society through this method, and it would be possible to determine if society was healthy or not, but looking at it pathologically, right? Social facts, if you aren't familiar, like the slide says, these are social rules, norms, laws, values, beliefs, rituals, customs, everything that kind of engages in our day-to-day -day life activity. And what he came up with, which is a very big idea, and this is what, it's why it's so important to see the construction of reality around us, right? That if we are in a position where society as a whole is functioning and we are able to go on our day-to-day -day life, good. If we have to start thinking about all the micro actions, uh, I refer to this in class as autopilot, right? Think about little think thought experiment. Think about when you get in a car, right? And you drive home from wherever you're parked. How often do you remember the whole car ride? If it's, a, if it's a path you've done a lot, a lot of times you remember getting in the car, getting home because you're on a autopilot, right? How many of you have said that you're gonna go to the gas station and then suddenly you end up in your house? These things happen. And this is what happens when we are on a good path. When things are interrupted, think about the pandemic when things were locked down, we fall into what was known as anomy. There's no true way to translate this. That's why we still use anomy. Uh, he was a French sociologist, right? So like a lot of it was from French when it was translated, which is great, but essentially it means normlessness. And anomy can create social change, but can also cause a lot of problems. Anomic behavior ends up leading to Drinking, abuse, violence, a lot of things when we feel normlessness, we feel just completely distraught from what's going on and disconnected, discombobulated. So think about how many people during the pandemic were reported to have increased depression, unaliving rates, right? Stuff like this. Anomie can be dangerous, but it can also be what helps us see that there's a big problem, fix it. So Emil Durkheim, founding father, we'll talk about him a lot in this course. Now some theories and contributions would be this. Robert Merton, who's one of my favorites, uh, came up with the idea of strain theory, which we'll talk about later. Self-fulfilling prophecy, this is an important one. Uh, we'll cover that much more when we get a little bit further in the courses. And the social processes, which this is what I was talking about, includes manifest functions, intended, important to remember for your quiz, latent functions, unintended. But then there's also, but usually beneficial, go to college to get an education, meet your life partner, right? That's a latent positive 
function. And dysfunctions. This is when we get bing, 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 red flags in the air, right? And we have this idea of a negative outcome that we need to fix. So Merton, very, very large person inside the field, came up with many great ideas. Another person here who wrote grand theory, he was once seen as one of the major, major voices inside functionalism, but not so much anymore. Uh, he wrote the social system, which is very interesting if you're at all wanting to learn about him, but Talcott Parsons, he was kind of a very wordy person, kind of like me. Uh, he wrote the ag agile paradigm, which is adaptive goal, goal attainment, integration and pattern maintenance, basically looking at how we engage with the social structure of life. This is how Parsons views social systems. Is there adaptation? Is there goal attainment, integration and pattern maintenance? And this will tell how we understand. He's been challenged throughout the years. He was considered a major voice inside the entire paradigm but as time went on he's been a little bit challenged here and there so not many people really refer to talcott parsons as much herbert spencer wrote the first book he used the word sociology the study of sociology so he gets a lot of credit for that uh, spencer rejected the earlier notions of compton marx and believed that the market forces the control of capitalism as opposed to the class struggle in support of communism spencer's works in inspired many sociologists as well as Durkheim. so he has a lot of help towards our life within the field of sociology of course and this pulls us into the next theory. So if you're a little worn out, you can pause. However, we're gonna now talk about social conflict theory, which if you're a fan of Marx and may know that name, he was one of the main contributors to this field. It's a macro theoretical perspective, meaning it doesn't consider itself as small issues. It doesn't care about if there is a battle between two different groups. It cares about what is the outcome for all of the groups because of this. It, em it emphasizes inequality in power structures in society, bourgeoisie and proletariats, right? Views society as a structured system based on inequality. Things are happening because the powerful are not allowing the unpowerful to have anything and thus the lack of people who control the means of production and those who produce the means is not equitable, thus creating conflict. And uh, social conflict between groups over scarce resources is the norm that stimulates change. Well, if we don't have rights to this, then we're gonna rally and try to get rights for this. This is where we look at with social conflict theory. Some key elements for this, society structured to benefit a few at the expense of the majority, right? We all know this, the 1% conversation. I feel like a lot of you have been at least somewhat educated in regards to social conflict theory, even if you don't know it, because it's the battle of inequality and equity, right? The idea that the rich control everything and that nobody gets anything unless you're part of the powerful. So this is the conversation that Marx talked about, the proletariat, the poor versus the bourgeoisie, or as we now commonly call people who are wealthy, they're acting bougie. That's where that comes from. Uh, that many times this is based around race, class, sex, and age are linked to social inequality, the intersections of our lives and the lack of resources. We're seeing this right now with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, right? Sex and are very much, or gender rights are being taken, uh, reproductive rights. So who's taking that? Well, white men are a part of the Supreme Court, right? So we're looking at this idea of the powerful being able to strike down laws that they feel aren't as important because it doesn't impact them. So you're looking at the idea of the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie and dominant versus minority group. Again, same thing before as what I just said. This is this idea of the group who's in power taking advantage of those who are not. So incompatible interests, major differences, and this is a it's a lot of an internal conflict. If you want a little TLDR, some fun fact here, Marx thought that capitalism would actually fail in the 1800s when we rose up against it, right? But major key person here to mention who we'll talk mostly about in this class with regards to social conflict is Karl Marx. He's one of the founding fathers who created conflict theory. He co-wrote the Communist Manifesto with Fred Engels, right? And that's a big book. He rejected the concept of positivism, which was founded by Comte, who's viewed as one of the first sociological minds, right? And essentially, people actually refer to themselves as Marxists. So you've probably heard that term before. But his views on the battles of the rich and the poor are very well known, and his views on social conflict are very well appreciated. Max Weber, who's a huge, huge theorist, very, very important, super important. Weber, by the way, it's not Weber. Uh, known for his book, The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, essentially looked at the idea of religiosity and how it applied into social values. Uh, he believed in the idea of verstehen or putting yourself into someone else's shoes to understand their situation and maintaining the idea of value neutrality through doing so. Uh, he did this with Dilthey and they introduced the important concept so that you can't understand something until you've lived it. Weber's work with anti-positism versus positivism led to the fields of research methods, which you'll probably take here in many other classes, and we'll talk about it in this class as well, right? This is the qualitative sociology where we seek to understand the behaviors of people by reaching out and talking with people and getting their understanding, and then using that data in a quantitative or a number-based system to figure out how we can find things here. Uh, his books on conflict and interaction are amazing. On my opinion, he's, pro he's prophetic. He's so, so interesting. His works are so powerful on authority, power, groups, behavior. He's a, he's a real, he's got the good vibes around him. Weber will talk about a lot. 
and contributions as well. C. Wright Mill's major contribution is his work on grand theory and talking about it as well as the sociological imagination, which he penned. It's how we view the world through sociology. Uh, Mills is a great theorist in general, but sociological imagination, uh, the white collar and coming up with the power elite are some of the major things that contribute to him. Continue here, we can talk a little bit more quickly. George Zimmel, he worked on the of groups, very important individual, we'll talk about him, how things change based on the size of a group. Uh, mechanical solidarity, pull back to when we talked about Durkheim, right, is very effective when you have a small group, we all have the goals and we need to link together to maintain those goals. Uh, this would be more of a dyad scenario where it's stable within the group, uh, but the problem is if the dyad, one person leaves the two person group, it's over, right? And then the triad, which is the idea of three, less encouragement towards individual thought but the idea is that we have now the idea of organic solidarity three people two v one elements start happening things start happening and what you're looking at is that with a larger group lo longer longevity and also the ability to have more vision more thoughts around something two people can agree on something it's done if there's three one person can disagree you don't have an agreement right think about how things are done within our political system, you have to have a certain majority, right? And then he also talked about the stranger, not too close to the group, yet not completely distant. This is kind of the person you can share that tea with and not worry about them being able to talk back to somebody, but it's an interesting element when you think about group dynamics. And uh, the Frankfurt School, if you want to talk about that, they worked on critical theory, which elaborated on the works of Marx. Critical theory is an expansion on conflict theory and is broader in just sociology. It attempts to address the structural issues causing inequality. I'm just clearing the slide here. Uh, you won't learn that much about the Frankfurt School within this class. It's just important to know it exists. And lastly, we're coming here to the symbolic interactionalist view. Uh, TL, just a little bit of exposure for me. I'm a big interactionalist. I really believe in the idea of the microdynamics. I agree with all three, but I tend to lean this way. That's a micro paradigm, best for smaller scale phenomena. Uh, view society as the product of everyday interactions, how we present ourselves in everyday life, the presentation of self in everyday life, why symbols matter, et cetera, et cetera. Definition and meaning given to the situation is central. How we understand situations based on our socialization and our cultural values. Society is a complex mosaic of understanding that emerges from the process of people interacting with their values, beliefs, norms, and traditions. So how we were raised, socialized, and what we understand plays into our perception of reality in the world. Uh, Goffman, a theorist, once said, be careful about the masks you wear because if you wear them too often, you may end up having that be your actual face. Meaning that if we don't understand the norms and values and we play too many roles, the role we don't like may end up being the role that we are represented as. So key elements here, words, objects, feelings that are given special meaning, stop sign, right? Uh, telling someone good job, right? These things tend to be very powerful, but they can have alternate meanings. Symbols hold values towards our socialization within our society, tying to when we talk about ethnocentrism, right? If you have a love for reading, it's likely that you were read to as a child. You built this through symbolic interactionism. So when you're looking at it from this paradigm view, understand that everything holds a value and it plays to our understanding of the world around us. Social interactions between two or more people, impression management, I just quoted a quote from Goffman, but we manage these impressions. Careful how you do it because you may want to manage this with this group, but how long until you become that group, right? If you pretend to be an a-hole, what happens when you become one? So be careful about impression management, but Goffman states we wear masks to manage the impressions that we're within and the impressions that we wanna manage and have to manage are important too. If you go to a doctor's office and they're dressed like me right now with this have a good day shirt, it's not gonna be something that maybe you see as a doctor. You may not even like that I'm wearing this shirt right now because it may not be prof prof professorial, right? Sorry for not speaking correctly there, but impression management is key. If I wanted to make sure I looked like a professor every time, I would put on a button up and you may have an easier time watching this, but I don't think that's necessary because the, the impression I wanna manage right here, so I'm your professor, you can reach out to me. I hope you know that. And that's kind of the idea of impression management. Development of self, we've talked about this in the lecture when you watch it, right? Me believe that the self is a total social construction <clears throat> in that there is no actual self and that we are all constructed from our socialization, as opposed to Cooley, who really built it around the idea that, well, self has more than one meaning and that we have a self, but we manage it also based on the mirrors of everyone's thoughts of us. So George Herbert Mead, as I just said, he's viewed as one of the big minds in here. Mead argued that how individuals come to view themselves is based on a large extent on the interactions of others. Mead's works included the micro level analysis, the generalized other, the significant other. Uh, if you watch my lecture on that, you'll see that this is the idea of if we have an understanding of the world around us or just those who are significant. The second stage is significant that we understand our parents. Generalized mean we understand when we go to a movie theater, people have roles they're playing. They don't live there. 
Meade's work on the self included the stages zero through two preparatory, as we'll talk about in a lecture, two through six play, and six through seven game stage. Important to know these stages, important to know that significant ties to play stage, generalized applies to game stage. Just mentioned Cooley. Cooley's famous for his looking glass self and quite a other few theories, but looking glass self is the one most people know. This is the idea that I know who I am, or I think I am, but my friends think I am, my mom thinks I am, my brother thinks I am, Dave thinks I am, Steve thinks I am, Jennifer thinks I am, and that builds a whole construction of who I think I am. <clears throat> so that's kind of the idea of a looking glass self. It's a mirror. I see myself, but everyone else sees me, right? And then I build that construction of who I am. He wrote the book, Social Organizations, Cooley formulated the crucial role of primary groups, AKA our family and the first people who raise us and the importance they play into our world. This is a play group and community of elders. And he also talked about secondary groups, which is the idea of our friends and family and how they socialize us outside of family, like uh, when you go to college or high school or you're socialized by others. The social process emphasized the non-traditional tentative nature of social organizations and the significance of social competition. It's a good thing, right? We are taught through social interactions, who we are, how we are, what we are, and what we do. Some theorists here again for contributions. We have Irving Goffman, who I quoted earlier. He wrote the idea of the dramaturgical approach, AKA dramaturgy. Goffman used this method of ethnography, which is observing social interactions to make connections, being able to go out, experience your world, very much tied to Weber's idea of Verstehen. Very notable work. I'm a huge Goffman fan. I'll probably quote him a lot. Uh, some notable works for him was the presentation of self in everyday life in 1956, Asylums, 1961, and Stigma. These are three books I highly recommend you read. They're kind of on my, you should read for this course. They're hard. He writes very, very detailed, but he's very interesting. He's famous for his work on impression management, his idea of front stage, backstage, life's a stage, and we act based on who we're facing. And then stigma management, right? How we manage our stigma and how we manage the idea of discredited versus discreditable and how people view us. Are we hiding something? There's something unhaving, unable to be hidden. And how does that stigma play into who we are? How do we manage impressions to avoid being categorized in a negative light? And then he also worked and coined the term total institutionalization. Think about these state-run psychiatric wards. He actually originally helped close. Uh, these places would degradate people and give them resocialization to take away their values per se. But yeah. That is a quick overview. Um, tying to what this is, why I wanted to make this important, has to do with the construction of reality. Uh, we in sociology do, and absolutely do, use these paradigms to look at the world. When we're looking at poverty, when we're looking at social engagement, when we're looking at political and social uproar, we try to think, is this a large scale issue, macro conflict theory? Is this an individual issue? symbolic interactionalism is this kind of a mid-level thing that we're seeing dysfunctions in our social construction of reality. Understanding these paradigms when we're going through the class is important. I want you to always keep your thinking hat on and I want you to think about this. How is it being looked at from structural functionalism, symbolic interactionalism, or conflict theory, and why does it matter? Talk about this on Yellow Dig. It's interesting. Understand these paradigms and it's good for you to get an understanding on them in general because what's going to happen is I'm likely going to have a paper for you to write and I'm going to ask you to write from these perspectives. This that will conclude our lecture for today. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you took something from this. If you have any questions, please feel free to follow with follow up with me or my TAs. Thank you so much.